Hey, everyone. So two quick things. First, my Facebook group page for The Suzanne Venker Show is back up. I'd been using that page for something else, but I have since moved it back to a private page just for listeners of The Suzanne Banker Show. I want a place where you all can talk with each other and where I can chime in periodically with questions and comments myself. So be aware that if you're itching to talk about the things you're hearing on this program, there is now a place to do that. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Suzanne's group. And if for some reason that doesn't work, just try going to Facebook and typing in the Suzanne Banker show and hopefully it will come right up and then click on join. Okay. Secondly, when was the last time you took a hot second to write a review of this podcast? I get super sad when I check it periodically and no one's written anything in like a week. I just wanted to tell you how much those reviews mean to me and to the algorithms too. Pretty sure the more reviews there are, the more the show will appear in other people's um, feeds and whatnot. So if you think you'll forget, like I know I probably would, keep in mind you can pause this program right now and do it and you won't miss a thing when you come back. We'll still be here in the same spot. That's my favorite thing about podcasts. They're like DVR, which is so awesome. Okay, on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Hey guys, real quickly, I just recorded this week's episode, so I'm jumping on here after the fact because I'm referencing a video that I made that you're going to want to see. And I told you to just type it in in Google, go to Instagram and look at my link tree or to go to Google and type in Suzanne Banker daycare. But that's really stupid because I can just link in the show notes (laughs) to where you need to go. So I'm just telling you now that I will start doing that. And, um, just ignore the going to Google thing. Just, I'll have the link for you in the show notes. Also, um, if you did Google it, you'd, you'd get something else at the top and I thought you'd be confused, but anyway, so going forward, I'm always going to have the links that you need in the show notes. And I have no idea why I wasn't doing that before, but I'm doing it now. Hey everyone, welcome back. Or I guess I should welcome myself back. I know it's been too long and, um, I meant it to just be for the month of July that I took off, but then I found out that Kelsey, my podcast producer was going out of town in August. So hopefully you got that last message because that just delayed us a little bit. But anyway, I'm here and um, got lots of stuff on the horizon. One of which um, I wanted to, it kind of just kind of came up in the last few weeks. Um, I hadn't planned to talk about the subject, this subject on my first day back to the show, but something transpired that I wanted to share with you all in case you missed it. So I did an interview with Alex Clark of Turning Point USA on their podcast called The Spillover about the many problems associated with daycare. And the response was so overwhelming that I recorded a follow-up video. And the response to that was even greater to the point where I just felt I needed to move my other topics aside that I had planned and talk about this um, on the podcast. If you're looking for those links, the best way to access them is on my link tree on Instagram. And if you don't use Instagram, then just Google Suzanne Banker Daycare and both videos should show up. To be honest, I moved away from this subject a long time ago when I moved into the relationship space, but I was up to my eyeballs in it for a very long time back when I wrote my first book about how raising young children and pursuing demanding careers are in natural opposition to one another. And I use that phrasing very carefully, raising young children and pursuing demanding careers, because that's not the same thing, for example as raising older children and pursuing a part-time career or just having a job or something. So these, these details matter when we're talking about this subject. And this was long before there were smartphones or social media or even YouTube when I wrote about this. And a lot of people don't know my history with this subject, especially as it pertains to the media. 
but I pretty much entered the lion's den when I wrote about the needs of children that there's no question about that. And at the time, like I said, since social media and YouTube weren't a thing yet, authors were dependent on the media to sell their books. And you can imagine how well that went over in my case, because if you are on the wrong side of an issue, you are basically SOL. I actually, I actually did get a fair amount of coverage, but of course the point wasn't, you know, excitement and to inform people, it was to take me down. That's, that's what their goal was. And at the time, um, I remember at that same time, the book Bias by Bernard Goldberg had been released. And that was the, um, the guy who you know, was kind of the whistleblower for the media. I think that's insofar as he was a liberal actually, but he lived with what he lived with seeing what went on behind the scenes and he couldn't take it anymore. So he basically laid it all out in a book about what, about how deep this bias really is. And now of course, everybody knows this 20 years later, but at the time it was very um, groundbreaking. So I was pretty green at the time, you know, not entirely green. I knew, I knew about media bias, but I didn't realize the scope of it myself. So it was, it was a very shocking experience and maybe I'll do a separate um video on that because that I mean um podcast on that because that's that's got its own like that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But anyway, my point is it's been really fascinating to read these comments on YouTube today in response to this video that I put together about the early years because many of them were so shocked to hear someone say what I've said. And yet in reality I said it a lot 20 years ago and got a very different response, again, because it was being filtered through the media. So it's been super gratifying to hear from all these folks, um, you know, the people, you know, with no um, gatekeeper, just nothing between me and the people, um, hearing from them, you know, parents who are home with their children, despite the lack of support and encouragement, and even from adults who were raised in daycare, many of whom I imagine were babies when I was first writing about this. So that's really neat. I mean, not neat because it's not good because a lot of them are talking about what was so, you know, what they struggle with today as a result of having bit daycare babies. Um, but interesting insofar as, you know, at the time when I was writing about it, they were literally there and now they've grown up. And then another fascinating, fascinating angle is all the comments from former daycare workers. I wasn't expecting this. And there's, there's a lot of them on YouTube. And this, of course, this group is an untapped resource since they know better than anyone what goes on behind the scenes, right? So one person who even chimed in didn't work with the children, but was a cook at a daycare. Like that's her job, which is super fascinating because that's really like being an objective observer. You're not working or distracted by working with the kids. You're doing something else completely, in this case, cooking, and you're watching all of this. You're just seeing it unfold. You're, you're just this amazingly just huge resource that no one's going to, you know, we never hear from. So, yeah, a wealth of information, uh, both in the short video I put together, it's about 15 minutes, and in the comments below. You, you're going to want to take the time to, to listen and read um, because it's, it's a lot. The problem, of course, is that if you try and talk about this issue publicly, what you're going to get is a conversation about money more than anything else, about the economy or about women having to work and daycare, therefore, is there is no choice in the matter. That's just what you do. That is absolutely true if you're a single parent, which is why this conversation is really directed toward two parent families. It can even be true to some degree with two in, two income families, two parent families, sorry, today, especially those who live on either coast where the cost of living is outrageous. But we need to understand how all this unfolded in order to figure out how to move forward if we're going to. This economy that we, that we created, we created this economy, I should say, by insisting first that mothers could never be happy at home. That's the message that came first. The economics of everything came later. All the income growth in the U.S. since 1970 has come from women working outside the home. That is what raised the GDP, making it harder for families to live on one income. 
Note the date, 1970. That's when feminists began their push to get mothers out of the home and into the workforce. It was a calculated, ideological, and political move. That's what got us to where we are. So while in some ways you can say, yes, the economics today are such that we, quote unquote, don't have a choice, although you do, and I'm going to get into that, or a lot of people do rather. Um, It's fair to say that we created this system that just keeps perpetuating itself, just feeds itself despite the fact that it's so unhealthy and destructive. The upshot of this conversation is that for 30 years at least, women have been groomed to believe they should make a career the central and primary focus of their lives for two main reasons. They're told that, one, it takes two incomes to survive in today's world. They grew up believing that. And two, there's this 50% plus divorce rate that is supposedly going to cause women to be cast aside financially. So they must always be employed throughout their lives to keep this from happening. I mean, if you were to ask somebody what the message was that they get, which I have endlessly, that's it. Those are those two. You, you have to work. Everybody needs to do this to survive. And you're going to get divorced if you don't. I mean, you're going to be screwed in a divorce if you're not perpetually employed. So let's begin by unpacking this narrative. Most families today are not dual income, not in the way you might think, with the way the media suggests, which suggests right off the bat that two incomes are actually not necessary for basic survival. Otherwise, most people would be doing it. When you're talking about married women with kids under 17, and that's my focus here, this is not about single parent families. That's another conversation. 46, only 46% work full time, 46% work full time, 17% work part time and 26% are not employed at all. Bringing the total of women who are, who either work part time or not at all at 43% compared to 46 who work full-time. Then you have to break that down in terms of the age of children. And when you do that, there are far fewer mothers in the workforce full-time with children under five. So you really want to get the numbers straight when you're talking about daycare, because we're talking about babies and toddlers, essentially, non-school-age children under five. Not just, I mean, yeah, let's just leave it at that. What this is really about is what people now consider to be basic survival, cost-wise, finances-wise, because in reality, the expectations for basic survival have skyrocketed. And this is in part because the modern generation has never had to make do with less. They lived, they've lived great lives. They've grown up with every possible comfort and convenience. They've never faced war or a depression. They've never had to save their pennies and wait until Christmas time to get that one special thing they want. They've never been told they couldn't buy something because they didn't have the cash. Just put it on credit, right? They've never been told to walk or ride their bike somewhere because there was no available car. They've never had to wear the same outfit two days in a row. They've never had to cook from scratch and make do with whatever's in the pantry. This generation has become so accustomed to an easy life that they just have no idea how to live another way. I mean, everything I just described there was just normal life for most people until really quite recently. And so in fairness to them, this is, this is the downside of having it so good. It's just a very hard to go back in your standard of life, which, or go down in your standard of living, let's say, which most people today will have to do if they're going to live off, live on one income. And as far as the other argument, about divorce, the divorce rate, um, you know, I've said this ad nauseum, I'll say it again, preparing yourself in advance mentally and financially for the end of your marriage is a surefire way to end your marriage because you're not really all in and you will wind up creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you don't have to be employed your entire life in order to land on your feet in the event of a divorce, by the way. You, you certainly need an education or a skill that you can utilize should you need to, but barring proof of abuse, most divorces result in a 50-50 split of assets and both parents are responsible by law for their children's care. So this idea that you need to remain in the workforce throughout your entire life 
in case you get divorced just doesn't hold up. Nevertheless, as a result of these two main fears that women live with due to their cultural conditioning, they've mapped out their lives accordingly. Lives that many of them come to regret because their plans didn't take motherhood into account. There were so many assumptions made based on lies and propaganda that were designed not with women's happiness in mind, but for the purpose of a political goal. This shift away from mothers at home to mothers at work was purposeful. It was never, it wasn't initially a financial conversation. It was initially and strictly and always has been political. Women were used as pawns by feminists who had no interest in motherhood and thus wanted society to accommodate them. And that brings us to the conversation today about daycare. I just wanted to give you that, that background because it's important because of this massive political push to get women out of the home, institutionalized daycare had to become sewn into the social fabric because this greater political goal could never have been accomplished without it. Most people are not going to be able to afford, only their upper echelons can afford a a full-time nanny, right? So they know that the masses, the regular people are going to need daycare. You can't get women into the workforce on a permanent basis if there is no system in place to get out of the way the very thing that keeps women from remaining in the workforce, and that's children. As time went on, And it was clear that daycare was not a good thing to be opened up to in the masses in this way. The powers that be had to make the concept more appealing. So daycare advocates changed the terminology. Also purposefully. We now call daycare child care and early childhood education. Because these terms serve to soften the reality and help people swallow the concept much more easily. And they did. That's why it's so difficult to talk about this subject without getting slammed from people who truly honestly believe that take care is harmless. The truth is that daycare was initially designed as a last ditch option for low income and single parent families which by the way is how Alex Clark of the spillover podcast opened our conversation because she had made that comment prior to talking with me and had taken a lot of flack for it, which is how she reached out to me because she wanted to talk about that fact. And she's right. That is how daycare began. It's a fact. But once the idea became more palatable over time with this other terminology, it became a way of life rather than this last ditch option that is not, um, you know, something that just should just be considered no big deal. And just to prove how true this is, because I know it can be hard for young people in particular to imagine a day when things were dramatically different than the way they are now. I'm going to read from a 1981 article about this subject, but I'm not going to tell you who wrote it until the end. This person writes, Too many Americans go out of their way to avoid individual responsibility for themselves and for their families. That is a shame. But a recent act of Congress puts the federal government in the position, through the tax codes, of subsidizing the deterioration of the family. That is tragic. I found myself virtually alone in the Senate recently when I tried twice to pass an amendment that would have made upper-income families ineligible to claim tax credits for daycare expenses. The Senate increased the maximum credits to 480 if only one child is involved and to 960 if a family sends more than one child to a daycare center while one or both parents work. Keep in mind, this is 1981 for those numbers. To show you how ridiculously this benefit can be used, I need only say that in 1978, there were 25 families with adjusted gross incomes of 1 million or more who claimed daycare credits, which were, sorry, who claimed daycare credits which were also claimed by more than 6,000 families with incomes of 100,000 or more. I consider it legitimate and necessary for the government to encourage single parents on limited incomes to get off welfare and into the job market or to help families of modest means 
to adequately provide the material necessities of child rearing. But what I do not accept is legitimate as a social policy that encourages a couple making $40,000 a year. And again, I did the math on that, that today would be $134,000 a year to evade full responsibility for their children by granting them a tax credit for daycare expenses. I do not believe it fair to ask a family of marginal income choosing to provide the primary care for their children to subsidize an upper income family's daycare. The title of that was Congress is subsidizing deterioration of the family. And that was written by our dear president, current president, Joe Biden. Now, of course, we know he'd never say that today because he's a political hack, but that's not the point. The reason why I wrote it, or I mean, read it, the point is to show you how normal it was at the time, again, 1981, on both sides of the political aisle to think about daycare. I mean, that's not that long ago. So to put that out there openly, which again, would never happen today, but if it if it did, I mean, it did happen then, clearly it's... Um, that was not shocking, I guess is my point, in the way that it would be today. This is how this is how propaganda works. It's very slow and methodical and it, and it happens over a slow period of time. But it doesn't matter what um it doesn't matter. The time period doesn't matter. This issue doesn't change. Children's needs don't change, whether we're talking today, 1981 or a hundred years ago, they are static. So anything that you, anything that we unearth about these early years and about daycare stands true, no matter what era we're talking about. So now I want to share with you with all that backstory in mind, I want to share with you material from the book I wrote 20 years ago, which is no less pertinent today, like I said, since the needs of children are the same. Many of the experts whose words I'm going to read did not get those words to see the light of day in any kind of mainstream way. And of course, we didn't have YouTube back then. Because again, in the past, there was always a gatekeeper, also known as the media, who decided what information would and wouldn't get disseminated. So a lot of these folks I'm going to read, it's not shocking to me, It might because I researched it and I've known about it for years, but to someone today, just hearing it for the first time, it might sound that way. There's so much political, uh, they're, they're just so politically charged by telling the truth that you'd have to really study to find this information. And that's what made me so uh, adamant at the time when I was writing it, because I wanted to get it out there because I knew it was being kept from people and they needed this information to make smart decisions for their families and their children. So one comment on YouTube um, was from someone named Claire who said, I listened to this. This is from my, again, my um, video last week. I listened to this because of its title, assuming it would tell us the truth about daycare. I agree that the lack of bonding is reason enough, but it might be helpful for parents to know what's actually going on in daycare facilities. So that's what I want to address now. Stay with me because there's a lot of information here. I'm going to try and go slowly. When I wrote my first book, I threw myself into the research on daycare and wound up intimately familiar with some names, like I said, that most people wouldn't recognize. Dr. Diane Fisher, Carl Zinsmeister, Deborah Fallows, Wendy and William Dreskin, May Sabier, Linda Burton, Jay Belsky, Dr. Stanley Greenspan. These are folks who at the time were experts on the effects of daycare on children, either from personal study and research or from personal experience working inside a daycare. Not unlike those people I said you can now find on YouTube comments. I'm going to read some quotes from each of them. This is from Dr. Diane Fisher, who wound up giving a congressional testimony with this information in 1997. Quote, academics, pediatricians, and other experts have learned to keep a prudent silence about the risks of daycare. And so it is the daycare advocates, and only the advocates, we hear from on our television screens and in our parenting magazines. Many of these advocates will in private candidly concede a gap, 
between their personal values and what they endorse professionally. But in public, you hear only the most unblinking loyalty. She adds, America suffers from a growing national epidemic of parental absence and disconnection. Quality in daycare cannot solve the problem. It doesn't even address it. End quote. Even Dr. Stanley Greenspan, author of The Irreducible Needs of Children, has said that America has struggled to improve daycare for 20 years without success. This was back then. Again, we're talking about 20 years ago. And that the only way it could be improved is for parents to provide most of their own care for their children. That way, there would be fewer people using daycare, and perhaps then it could have a fighting chance. And ironically, that was Biden's argument in, 19, in that 1981 op-ed that I read. It's not not having the existence of daycare. It's keeping it for what it was originally intended so that it has a fighting chance. In other words, keeping it super small for a certain segment of the population. Dr. Jay Belsky, we find clearly, who did the longest study ever, a uh, longitudinal study over a period, that means over a long period of time, on daycare, and this is the, the, the sort of the, um, how do you say, you know, it's the most significant um, study on daycare to date. We find clearly, indisputably, and unambiguously that the more time children spend in daycare, the more likely they are to be aggressive and disobedient, he said, end quote. The report also found that the results are the same, regardless, this is important, of the type or quality of daycare the sex of the child, or whether the family is rich or poor. Quote, what matters most is time. The more hours spent away from parents, the more likely children are to have behavioral problems. End quote. That's kind of common sense, in my opinion, but I certainly have run across many, many people who can vouch for that personally. Like I remember my, um, when our daughter went to preschool a few hours a week, a few days a week for a few hours a week at the age of three and a half that her preschool teacher. And I had, I had my book was, I had written the book at the time that I told you about. And she's like, I can tell from the moment I get my new class, who's been in daycare and who's been at home. I'm just, it's just, that's just a, that's just a given year after year, after year, after year. This is the kind of, private information that is not available to the public because of politics. In 1962, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare's Office of Child Development published a booklet entitled Your Child from One to Six. Now, again, you might hear, oh, 1962. Doesn't matter. Children's needs don't change. They're no different today than they were 100 years ago. So the year that you hear this is totally irrelevant. In the section on babies and toddlers, it reads this. If the toddler continues to receive the warm assurance he has had, he will grow more sure of himself. If he is pushed out faster than he is ready to go, he will always be a little less confident and a little more dependent on others than he might otherwise have been. These early experiences have a lifelong effect. Even though the child doesn't remember what actually happened and lacks words to give it shape in his mind, the feelings remain. He learns that he can count on people or that he cannot, that he will be allowed to try things out or that he'll be constantly thwarted. These characteristic ways of looking at things tend to persist and become a part, excuse me, a fixed part of the personality. And again, if you're going to go to YouTube and read some of these comments, you'll hear from some of these kids who were in daycare and the problems that they're having today in adulthood are commensurate with what I just read there. Back to Diane Fisher. We must remember it is the emotional development of the infant that forms the foundation upon which all later achievements are based. For the infant, a mother is the environment, prenatally and postnatally. As a society, we are uncomfortable admitting this but it is a biological fact. That sounds very similar to uh, Erica Komisar, who I know you guys have heard 
me talk to on this program several times. William and Wendy Dreskin. So this was a couple and I actually, actually ended up meeting her. She lives in California years later after I'd written the book, I met her. Um, this was a husband and wife couple who had started out having an in-home daycare with just a couple of kids and it was successful, you know, like that there's a, there's a, I think I've said this before. There's, um, a hierarchy in terms of, you know, ideal care for babies and toddlers that you've heard me talk about, right? Mom, then dad, grandma, or other family member in home, small care, one or two, three children with one person. Um, and then, daycare of course is at the bottom. And this couple just assumed that, um, because they're, you know, two or three baby daycare was successful that, that it would work in mass form. So they, they opened a daycare center and I don't remember how many years they had it running, but they did. And uh, fabulous book. It's called the daycare decision. I don't even know if you can get it anymore. But talk about everything you'd ever want to know. It's in there. The Daycare Decision, William and Wendy Dreskin. They write, quote, The truth is, young children do not form a strong attachment to a person they see little of, no matter how kindly the person is or how superlative the quality of time spent together. End quote. And their message was their, you know, being with these babies and toddlers 10 hours a day, um, and they're just going home to sleep and shower and well, they don't shower, but sleep and have a bath and whatever is, is never going to be enough. That was essentially their point. And then today we have, like I said, a moment ago, Erica Komisar, the psychoanalyst who treats patients whose mental health problems stem from having had many of them, not all of them, but there's a good thread there of those who um, had absent parents and she's coming out to say, Hey, all this anxiety, all this stuff I'm seeing it's related because their backgrounds are all similar. Quote family, including extended family is the best way to care for children. Daycare is the least healthy option, especially in the first three years. It leaves children bereft, anxious, and depressed. End quote. And then sometime later, a woman named May Sabier uh, sought me out because she had written a book called Doing Time, What It Really Means to Grow Up in Daycare. And this was a big deal to have done this, of course, and she was didn't get very far again because she was up against the media. But she worked inside daycare for years and wanted to, basically she was a whistler, whistleblower too. And um, she wanted to tell people what is really going on inside so that they could well, just know for one thing, and then also make better decisions. Uh, let's see. Here's one comment. Quote, a baby who spends five years at one particular center, center will lose one third to almost half of her caregivers every 12 or so months. By the time he leaves, most of the original staff will not be there. End quote. So what she's referring to there, of course, is the high turnover that exists in daycare, which is the number one problem as to why it can't be effective because babies are, or toddlers are starting to, you know, bond with somebody who disappears and that has a lifelong effect on them. And of course you can't have one-on-one -on -one care in daycare. That's really the most obvious point of this whole thing is everybody knows that there's no way to get one-on-one -on -one care in a daycare. So that's, that's the problem with it. And it's not, it's not something that, I mean, the larger you make it, the less that will happen. For example, another comment um, she made in her book, while parents are busy at work in this very moment, they do not know who is caring for their child. This is one of the many, many absolute daycare truths that has never been spoken or perhaps even realized. Why? Because relief workers are called in to take care of the children before the regular workers arrive in the morning, after they leave in the afternoon, while they take their lunch breaks, when they leave to use the bathroom, and when they're out sick. Consequently, children in daycare continuously are continuously exposed to new people who are trusted to care for them while their parents and their providers are absent. End quote. Which means 
you know exactly what it says that your 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 infant or toddler is being cared for by somebody you've never met okay so in conclusion you might ask as many on social media have after i did that um short video how is this going to make low-income parents who must use daycare feel low-income or single parents feel and the answer to that well it's twofold number one there is no way to address any widespread social problem and not upset anybody like that's not even a thing that's not possible so there's that which is by the way why it continues to go on and we have the problems we have because there are so few people like for example erica komisar who's going to come out and say hey there's a there's a connection between the anxiety and depression that we're seeing and what happened in the early years of of children's lives um which again has more than one there's one more than one reason for that this is just one of them but a bigger answer to that is that they shouldn't have to be in this position low income families or single parent families if the experts from a long time ago as well as biden in 1981 i mean the old biden like i said we don't know he's just a pawn now it's not significant what he would say now but what he said then and what the experts pointed out if parents who can afford to take care of their own children would do that then daycare could remain a necessity for the families who are i.e single fam- single parent families or low income and then it would have a fighting chance instead it's a way of life for all families as though it's just no big deal and of course it's so giant that it doesn't it's completely ineffective so that just shows you how much that switch from having it be a safety net to just a way of life for anyone who wants to use it has negatively affected the the smaller numbers of people who who technically do need it and also i want to say that the point of this whole conversation about the early years isn't that mom and baby can never be separated that you can never use any type of care in the early years that's that's not it the point is that a baby's development has stages and you can't skip a stage and expect the same result which is what full-time daycare does so for instance a 1-year-old may be able to handle an hour or two away from his mother okay but he's not going to be able to handle 10 hours away and no one ever makes these distinctions the details about well how long can a baby be apart or away from mom and or dad and that that just isn't there it's not it's like we're you're either away or you're not you know there's just so much going on in there um and it's not just about being away from this mother in terms of attachment but also the lack of sleep proper sleep and nutrition that is going to be inevitable when parents are not there to do the work themselves if they're abdicating that responsibility to to hired help then you don't know what's going on in that in that time that you're not there number 1 and you cannot expect that person to care the way you're going to care about the sleep and the nutrition of your baby and toddler i mean they couldn't care less if your baby sleeps or eats right they're not the one who's going to be with them at the end of the day and plus it's not their child so the parent is the one who's going to deal with the fallout of that not the daycare worker and this same goes with the behavior problems as the children get older whatever's going on during the day there when you're not there is imprinting on your child how to move through the world how to behave and you're going to get that at the end of the day and you're not going to be able to do anything about it because you don't even understand how what happened during those hours you weren't there so it's a very very delicate process as to what's going on in these early years and if you're not there you're going to be you're going to deal with the fallout of that so there's just a great deal of information that's left out of this debate but at the end of the day it comes down to the same kind of uh conclusion and that is that making daycare a way of life for married middle and upper middle married and middle upper class families cha- not upper class really but married middle and middle upper families changed everything if 
daycare had remained or could remain a last ditch solution. This could be a win-win for everyone because daycare centers would be significantly less crowded and therefore would have a better chance of being effective, which is what, again, Dr. Stanley Greenspan, Greenspan said 20 years ago, the only way to give it a fighting chance is for fewer parents to use it. Full stop. And as a woman on, uh, as a woman named Alex on Instagram wrote on a comment, quote, everyone has a choice. And I say this as a working mom. People can adjust their lifestyles if they want to be home raising their children. Many just don't or won't, end quote. And I would add that there are different reasons why people don't, but a big one is that they really just don't understand that daycare is harmful. They don't know that because nobody wants to talk about it. And then the second piece is that they are assuming and thinking that you have to have both those incomes to just survive. And the truth is, unless you're both making six figures, usually that second income is eaten up by all of the work-related costs and the childcare being, of course, the biggest. And it's even getting greater. Now, I guess I heard from someone yesterday who's like, my entire, my wife's entire paycheck goes to pay for daycare. So then you're like, what? I mean, make, that doesn't make any sense. So just remove that uh, cost from your budget and do it yourself and you'll be richer. So there's just, if you want something really bad, you will find a way to make it happen. The issue is that there isn't any reason for a lot of people to want to do it because they don't, first of all, they lack information. Second of all, everyone around them seems to be doing it and B, they're just sort of on this perpetual money. Um, th- this concept that they have to live a certain way uh, is not ever, um, what's the word questioned, questioned so that when you put pen to paper and, and really see how you're spending, um, you could see that for X amount of years, you could, you could live on one income unless of course your spouse isn't employed or something. Um, but yeah, so that's it. I just wanted to make sure I covered that topic since there's so much behind the scenes in the last couple of weeks since I've been absent and I wanted to make sure I covered that before moving on to next week's topic. So, um, that's all I got. Have a good week, and I'll see you guys next time. And that ends this hour of The Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review, as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at thesuzannevenkershow.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash The Suzanne Venker Show. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.